Hey, my name is John Butler, a, a local entrepreneur here in St. John's. I'm here with my good friend uh, Grant Genova, who's a senior architect here in the city. And today we're going to talk about uh, Jane's Walks. This year's Jane Walks have been hosted throughout the month of May by Happy City St. John's, which is a nonprofit organization that informs, encourages, and facilitates public dialogue around civic issues in the city of St. John's. Okay, so I always like to start these walks with. Uh a comment on Jane Jacobs because that's what this is all about. It's in celebration of Jane who uh, was an urban thinker, author, a very interesting lady. Uh, her primary note of, note of uh, authorship was Death and Life of the Great American City, but she wrote many books. She actually was uh, one of the main people that stopped the Spidan, the Spadina, Spadina, yeah, Spadina, Spadina, and I'm and I'm from Toronto, Spadina Expressway, from entering and and gouging into uh, Toronto from a north-south angle. They already had the Garden Expressway, you know, which was a bit of a problem. But um, the beginnings of uh, Jane was in New York City, and uh, she is. Uh, from the beat generation which is precursor to the hippie group matter of fact we stole a lot from them uh, and they're not given the credit you know Allen Ginsberg and different people um, but her and her husband were young adults living in Greenwich Village and um, it's interesting she was working as a uh, war correspondent for propaganda actually she was a uh, part of the uh, a, a, an office for war information and her husband was an architect and he could he couldn't find any work either of course during the war and he ends up designing war planes and they both become uh, advocates of uh, urban design uh, issues and problems and if there's two main things that I think well, one main thing is that Jane should be credited by every single urban planner as well as architect, including myself, whereby she made us socially conscious of our, our environment and how it's connected to human beings rather than just building for no good reason at all. And she really brought that consciousness forward, not only in her books, but in her actions because she did a lot of advocacy work um, all around New York City. They were trying to tear down, for instance, Harlem. Uh, it was this under the title, especially in the late, the early 50s, called Urban Renewal. It sounds, it sounds fine, but they were actually destroying uh, very viable neighborhoods. And if there's two things that she, I believe she should be noted for, is that she embraced conflict she took on every single urban issue and most of them are conflicting and we shouldn't shy away from that ourselves we don't live in a sanitized we shouldn't be living in a sanitized environment uh, it's constantly on the move cities are for all of us to talk about and she also embraced chaos and what i mean by that is that she actually wanted people to look at things that were ugly and really uh, dissect what they what that that urban setting was all about and not destroy it just because it didn't meet the most current dwell magazine image and really look at um, the urban fabric in a in a uh, very open way One thing that I try to do at the beginning of these walks is also announce a, a disclaimer, I guess, or that I'm responsible for everything that I'm saying. This is my personal point of view, although I'm a trained architect and, and urban type of person. Uh, these are my points of view, but I think it's good for someone such as me to kind of key in some ways that the general public could possibly start capturing uh, a point of view that would allow them to start talking about our urban problems. And there's two main books 
that came out during the time that I was uh, in college. One of them was by Kevin Lynch, and that one, its, its title was Image of the City, and the other one was uh, by Christopher Alexander, and its title basically was Pattern Language. Kevin Lynch in, in Image of the City, basically, it's a, it's a good read for anybody, but he basically talks about the city in terms of uh, possibly monuments that are in the city. He uses Boston as an example, but uh, certain key monuments or certain configurations of the roads that, that cause certain uh, areas of, of, of the community to come together, certain triangles, uh, uh, certain shapes of, 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 of the community because of the housing, uh, uniqueness of that. A good example of that that probably everyone in St. John's is familiar with is uh, uh, the city of Montreal and how the, the mountain, Mount Royal, acts as a beacon no matter where you are in the, in the city. And it becomes a, a means to tie together and give you comfort that you're not lost and you know, you're part of the city. Uh, the book that Christopher Alexander did, which is uh, Pattern Language, um, is an interesting book because he basically is trying to explain how we uh, are right now. We're, right now in this little group that we're uh, dealing with, we're three people. One's filming, me, I'm talking, and Kelly's uh, listening in and making suggestions with her face and whatever. But all, all that is the realness of what we're doing. If we're sitting on the, this porch over here and we're talking with somebody that walks by, all these configurations are either helping us to do that or not. not. What, he, what he was willing, or what his studies did was uncover the, the actual pattern that you actually perform, the geometric pattern of all these ways that you're operating in, in the space that you're in. And he laid this out very specifically. We're down to uh, part of the patterning would be a, a rock wall was on the edge defining the space, an umbrella was sitting, and, and we take all these things for granted, but they're not. They actually are the way we comfortably use our environment. So those two things, pattern languaging, and image of the city is a good springboard for understanding uh, St. John's. Off we go. The way this was labeled last year was called the hidden stroll. And uh, John Butler sort of labeled it. And I think it's a good title. Uh, really what we're trying to do is walk the pedestrian pathways that go all through uh, St. John's. And we're actually going to walk from Georgetown, which is uh, a primary plateau. There's a set of other plateaus that we're going to, our elevation will go down and we go all the way to the harbor. And, and we, we come upon uh, pathways that are constricted or they're, they, they're, they're uh, reasonable. Uh, they are not supported by the, the city for some reason. They're not, uh, I don't know of them cleaning things up except maybe neighbors do that. Uh, some of the pathways are constricted and some of the pathways open up to where we're standing right now, which is really the potential of a public park, except nothing is going on in this. And this is interesting because we were just here, you know, four or five days ago. And if you pan over into this park, we now have cars <laughs> parked in the park. And I guess that's why they label it a park. <laughs> I don't know. But the, the, We'll be talking about this in a, a few moments along the, uh, uh, the, the path that we encounter. And the re this is an, an area that we've got to start opening up in conversation and almost become collaborative as, as a group of people to start solving how do we want the car to be in our lives? Because it's, it's now at a point where <laughs> Uh, what really should be only a pedestrian space has been encroached on by an automobile. And they've got, pl they've got plenty of other places, <laughs> but it just so happens to be convenient for, for here. You know. Okay, off we go.
these walks uh, in the past, and I've probably done them seven times or whatever. One of the groups that uh, we do the same walk for, but a little bit different twist, is uh, the Historic Trust group that runs uh, Doors Open for the city of St. John's. And we've got the same problem that we've got to figure out how to do video taping, which you guys maybe will be part of. Uh, but on that walk, there's a lot more historical comments, uh, talking about the certain cottages in this area that were established uh, when the city of St. John's was the primary place to, to live and so forth. But I like to mix a little bit into this walk, even though it's Jane Jacobs, uh, because you know the history and the fabric of the city is a very important thing to identify and do your best to maintain, which we don't do enough of in, in the city of St. John's. We just need to activate that a little bit more. But basically, um, this area called Georgetown uh, happened after the, primarily the 1892 fire, which caused about 11,000, 15,000 people to be homeless. And they had to very quickly uh, establish a play, you know, houses. They had to build these houses very fast to give people uh, new homes to live in. Before that, though, this actually was uh, St. John's first suburb. And I know a lot of people go, how can that be? It's just next door to the city. But you've got to realize that the way that you got here was by uh, horse or by foot or by horse and buggy. And that makes it a totally different time space formula. Like time space for us is, oh, no problem. I'm going to go all the way out to Costco and get my stuff because I can hurdle there at 65 miles per hour and there's no issue. But at this particular era of 1892, we have a totally different way of, of, uh, of doing transportation. So we end up with, in this area first, before the fire, there, it was a set of cottages, uh, but fairly substantial houses, which were the secondary houses of, of uh, uh, people that lived in uh, downtown. And they would come out here on a, you know, during the summer and they had uh, their gardens out here. This was a lot of farmland. So basically what happened after the fire it was the open space closest to downtown because it was, you know, it was where all the gardens were. So they were able to build. What happened when they built it um, was because they were very conscious about fire obviously, they started building pathways and, and actual roadways behind the houses. Although these houses are what we would call party wall type of houses, they allowed access in the back. And that's why we have these walk, the, the, these pathways today. They really were put there initially for fire, but then they got linked to, there was an opening between a set of buildings and that became a pathway to get back to the street. We're going to talk about this a few times along the uh, route, but it's this whole idea of uh, St. John's embracing fog, wind, and rain, and I added elevation to that. But it's the idea that we need to start building our public spaces that actually allow us to use them at the beginning, just before we're going into winter and as we're coming out of winter. I do realize although some of us here do spend time in, in, in the snow, that's not necessarily what these public spaces will be. But we don't do enough of designing, of, of, of working out the problems and working out the variables that need to go in to this park that we're sitting in right now. We think by just making a, put a tree in the park and have benches, that that's enough for St. John's, and actually it's not. For St. John's, and with the new technologies that we have, I should be able to power up my phone here. I should be able to get Wi-Fi in this little spot. I should be able to get a little bit of radiant heat, uh, you know, that, that makes me a little bit more comfortable. Maybe the space blocks the wind a little bit uh, so that I can get into a zone of the space, but I'm still outdoors. And these investments should be how we handle uh, parks. For instance, in Bannerman Park, there should be probably they have a gazebo in Bannerman Parklet, but it does nothing. It just sits there as a space. It needs to be more in St. John's. And then when you add technology to all of this, such as uh, Wi-Fi and to cell phones and all of that, um, you, you, can, you can see how it, 
it could possibly lace together more, more interesting things for people to do outdoors. And one, th one thing I asked my group when I was dealing with uh, Solomon's Path, which was a project that we were on a few years back, how far would they walk in a j storm, a, 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 a profound storm? And they all said a block. So that's exactly where the city should have a resting spot, an ex interior, exterior resting gazebo with all of this, all these gadgets. The city should be investing, putting those so that when we're walking in the worst condition, we can get out of the problem for a moment. You know, brush the ice off and continue on <laughs> is probably what would happen in St. John's. But the little building that's behind me the way I kind of labeled this a few years back was strange ends up unique. And it's very important that we um, continue to embrace the odd things in our neighborhoods, the odd things that are built, and not try to homogenize everything and sanitize everything into one appearance. And some things will end up looking very run down and if we were to talk in terms of Jane Jacobs, she would say, please look at it more seriously, look at it more deeply, and realize that that chaos might end up a jewel. And this is a good example because for the past five, six years that I've been doing this walk, because it's always the same walk, we add a few different roads sometimes, but this was a very rundown piece of uh, property. And most people would say it would be good to tear it down. And in reality, look at it now, it's like a tiny little odd thing that um, really adds to the uh, community. This kind of like begins to, becomes a springboard to the whole discussion about zoning. And um, I don't have this thought completely clear in my own head yet, except I was explaining the last time we did this that it, it seems odd to me that when you look at all the municipal plan, you know, planning documents, right? Those, those wonderful documents that come out that take years to put together, and you're reading the beginnings of it, and they're talking about a healthy city, they're talking about livability, they're talking about, they're making all these comments about making the city better, and they mean it, they're doing everything they can to try to do something about that. But then when you look at the zoning bylaws, there's nothing in the bylaws that addresses anything to do with a human being. It's always in response to where the building should be and set, setbacks, or where the car is supposed to be parked, or how many cars are allowed on your lot, or on, the, you know, it has all to do with everything but the human being. But at the beginning of the report, all the comments are about, we're going to do better for the human being. So you're, I wonder, if they're, they're understanding that the, the zoning bylaws have to be changed. The, and, and that's another thing that a lot of people, we made, we, as human beings, we made the laws. I'm not, I'm not trying to change the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, when you murder somebody, you murder somebody. I'm not, those are not the, but the bylaws were created by human beings, and a lot of the zoning bylaws were because people that were far wealthier than my family, which was Irish and Sicilian, they basically wanted you to stay out of their neighborhood, so they created zoning. That's where it all comes from. It doesn't come from uh, a quality statement. It was to keep people who were of less whatever out of their neighborhood. We've got to change this. We're not going to get to livable cities and, and healthier cities and, and inclusion. For sure, we're not ever going to get to inclusion uh, if we don't look at the laws. And I, I've made this comment many times, and I try to soften it now, because when I first started talking about it in the city, people would get very startled. Because I used to say, Buckminster Fuller, who, used to, who is credited for designing the geodesic dome, well, he did design the geodesic dome at Expo 67 in Montreal really an amazing philosopher and, and, and man. He wrote a book called Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, which has all been forgotten about, but he was an initial person trying to get us to understand we're a hurtling little blue dot. He said in a lot of the lectures that I heard of his, 
you have to burn it down every 25 years. And what he was meaning was you have to burn down the ideology, probably now because of our technology, it could be every five years, it could be every 10 years, but some of these things are so set up that every time you try as a homeowner or as a uh, interested uh, uh, person that cares about the city, the legal department from the city will say, well, that's against the bylaw. That's got to stop. This is a walk because it's a, uh, you know, focused on Jane Jacobs, where we're trying to identify conflict and embrace the conflict and possibly get a group of people together to start collaborative design thinking to start trying to solve some of the things that we end up having to uh, uh, be forced to deal with. This particular space, because as I said, Georgetown was established, we'll, we'll say around 1900, and this was actually a green space. But because of the ownership of the properties around it and functionality, very specific functionality, I want it easy, people that just parked while we were doing this and blocked the pathway, um, they're unloading uh, soil. Um, so I fully understand that part, but you'll be surprised how a medieval village in Italy deals with the same problem. Number one, it's not a big truck. Number two, it's a detachable kind of uh, uh, a trailer type system, and it's very small. And they actually have more mobilization because they have a little motorized thing that goes along with it, and they unload the stuff very quickly, and they leave the medieval village. The reason that it they came up with those design solutions in the medieval village was because the geometry didn't allow them to do anything but the narrow, the far narrow streets. Like we have some medieval qualities in St. John's, but most of it is over uh, driven by the car. And there's something to be said about us getting together as a, as a group of concerned citizens, whoever wants to get involved, and start discussing how we want to balance the automobile and our livable uh, abilities uh, in our city. Because there's too many decisions that are made, and this is a good one, we talked about this last time, democracy is supposed to be inclusive in some way, that's what we mean by it, yet there's, we'll just say there's 20 people making the decision that they park their truck and all, and I'll just make it up, 300 other people that are supposed to use this space don't get to make that decision. And it's, it, I know it's, based, I, I, I'm not stupid, I know it's ownership, it's control, it's territory and whatever, but you got to add the word sensitivity because some of these things are becoming overpowering and all of a sudden I'm not too sure, although probably some people locally would say, I'm okay, I love going out to Costco and Strafanger, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, is it Strafanger? Stravanger. I always pronounce Stavanger. it wrong. Sta. Stafanger. Uh, I'll never get it. But anyway. Stavanger. All, 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 all to say, I believe, yes, we need that but we also need a balance. And if the balance isn't there, we've just, we've begun a deterioration, which I can show you all up and down the Northeast of uh, North America, how it's been destroyed. Whole, whole towns were destroyed because they allowed Walmart in. And that's where the city officials, the councilors and whatever, have to ask themselves, am I increasing the diversity of, of, our, neighbor, of our 
town, of our city, increasing the d diversity index. It's got to be very high. And am I asking for balance within, my, within the society, not just run by one thing? Okay, we'll be talking ab about a few of these things later on in the in the walk, but I don't think you're we're able to uh, talk about urban problems anymore, especially since COVID and climate change has caused us to rethink how we want our <laughs> places that we live in to respond a little bit better. Um, it was an interesting thing that happened during Snowmageddon, and everyone remembers that. And, and that was the fact that because we have no food security on this island, the urban configuration of how we had to handle that problem because we needed to get to food was that everyone had to somehow find their way out to Costco because Costco ended up to be the primary supplier of our supplies for a few weeks. What's strange about that is that I don't really want the diversity index. This is good. Uh, but the the diversity index, if you were to you know sort of talk about that problem, was Costco ends up their board that is located, I think, in North Carolina or something. I don't know, is making decisions for our well-being in St. John's and they're the only ones making that decision and I remember the you know and I have a lot of friends that go to Costco and I'm guilty of doing that too especially when I had my 15 year old who is now 40 year old now but the the idea is that Costco is going to solve all of our problems we're going to have to deal with however they orchestrate that and what's peculiar is that the city of St. John's allowed them to those people are probably hired by Costco okay um, the first path the first snow path that was completely uh, dealt with was the path out to Costco all the snow trucks went out and took care of that first <laughs> And rightly so, I, I, I understand, but you begin to see there's a little bit of a problem because it should have been maybe 10 organizations trying to get food to the public. And so ur urban design and its configuration and the decisions behind it do affect when we have serious problems like flooding or hurricanes or snowmageddon. And the idea of inclusion and, and being able to work that problem out. There was a lot of stuff that came out after Snowmageddon, which I felt we should be spending more serious time on simulating the problems that could happen rather than saying how, and I know I'm not taking away from people who really helped. I'm just saying only focused on how well we did through it is not the only information that should come out of that type of problem.
Okay, as we know, this walk has got a lot to do with uh, public laneways and uh, how basically in, in the city of St. John's they're not being maintained. This one over here is a good example of encroachment. And getting, getting an understanding of this, um, it took me a while to get, get around this issue in the town that I live in, which is outside of St. John's called uh, Pooch Cove. And I was helping a neighbor with the, uh, their site survey. And I saw on the site survey Bank Road. And I thought it was Mr. Bank, right? It was just named after some family. And then I noticed on another survey that I was looking at, another bank road and another bank road. And, and then I noticed in town there was another bank road. So then I started exploring what this, uh, what this meant. And basically it had to do with the, the public access, meaning group access, to all the fishing stages that used to be on the edge of the cove of Pooch Cove. And that was the way that you got down to your... Uh, fishing stage, your, your, your work platform. And realize these things were small little buildings, but there was possibly 20 of them. So we're talking about 20 different families going down there and dealing with the cod, cod industry. Same thing is true in Florida. I, I grew up in Florida and it has to do with access to the beach. Now when I moved down there with my parents when I was 10 years old, the, the beach was there, there weren't any condominiums on the beach. There might have been one or two hotels or whatever. But no matter where you were, you could just pull over on the side of the road on A1A and walk through the, the bush and you'd be at the beach. But then all the condos got built, all these high-rise, at least 20, 30-foot buildings. And once they blocked the beach, you weren't allowed on their property. So, okay, you could go down a little ways and find another little space to go through and get to the beach because the beach is property for everyone. Finally, it got built up so much that the public started complaining and they actually got a law put on the books that caused the hotels as well as the condos to have to create a portal through their property to get to the beach. Because what was happening was because the condo association thought they owned the beach, they started actually blocking people from walking across when they were in the water. <laughs> they were claiming it and then realized it's international law. That is true in St. John's and Newfoundland. The edge of our ocean is public domain. It's true for this. All these public pathways are public domain, but it takes probably laws and some legislation to start protecting them. Um, we're standing in the uh, Basilica parking lot, and I want to emphasize parking lot. Um, it's kind of peculiar because there were there were periods of time in our different uh, places and how we constructed our lives and whatever, especially in and around the horse and buggy and the carriages and all of that. And if you can imagine yourself actually the horse and the buggy and the pedestrians going through a uh, Versailles garden, a formal garden, which was the site plan of the basilica. And of 
course, you were you were dropped off at the door, so it didn't mean you walked, especially if you were wealthy. Uh, you were dropped off at the door, and then the carriage went and parked itself somewhere else. And now, and nowadays, it's like everybody in the car needs to get to the door as close as possible. Yet there's probably three or four people in the car that could use some walking. Yeah, there might be an elderly person in the car that needs to go to the door. But it's a lot easier to, to drive a car than to drive a horse, if you know what I mean. I mean, it's really convenient. The, the idea of a car is like extremely convenient. And nowadays, they're so comfortable, I'm, I'm wondering if we're even driving them anymore. But yet, it's the whole, whoever's in the car all has to get to the closest spot to get to the front door. And that's just a way of thinking that I think we could, I mean, the other way was far more gracious, far more elegant. It was a, you know, a lifestyle that came with whatever supported all of that. And there, as I said, there used to be a very formal garden here, and yet it's been overcome by the car. And it's again the argument, and I don't think it should be an argument, I think we should open it up to a discussion about how far do we provide for the car at the point where it's starting to deteriorate the, the healthy and the livability of the city. Um, there's a known lyric of uh, Pink Floyd, which was uh, Stephen Hawkins. Uh, actually, it's his voice. And he says, uh, for millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals. Then something happened which unleashed the power of our imagination. And what he says is we learn to talk. And I am in no way Stephen Hawkins, but I'd like to change that a little bit. I think we learned art first. We, er we learned how to draw pictures, and that's how we communicated to each other. And I find that's kind of lost, because when we have issues like I'm going to talk about here, which is the potential of a major development happening in St. John's. It actually has only been quieted because of COVID. It'll come back around soon. Where you've got this difference of elevation of approximately 40, 45 feet. And they had public meetings on this. And there just doesn't seem to be proactive uh, statements coming from the city that would guarantee that this particular project would be inclusive and very, and address the business of walkability and mobility for the city. And one of the only ways that you can understand this is by drawing a picture. Drawing the fact that you're entering from military trail up 40, 45 feet in elevation, and you're ending up at where we're sitting right now. And there actually is going to be a, a building which is a volume and there's the potential of that building becoming a public thoroughfare, which allows you any time of day to go from the elevation on military all the way to the elevation on Queen in an easy way, more than likely an escalator or an elevator that gets provided by this new development. An example of this also is downtown when we were working on the Solomon Path project we started trying to address the fact of how do you make the city more accessible especially downtown and we'll be talking about this again in George in, in uh, on George Street but we realized that the TD building actually connects 
Duckworth, which is 35 feet above water, it connects Duckworth to water accessibly. The problem is, is that that zone that is that corridor with the elevator is not a public thoroughfare. It's controlled by the building, so the building ends up closing at six o'clock at night, and all of a sudden accessibility has disappeared. Same example, and this is where, and we'll be talking about this on George Street, but it's, it's the same problem where solving problems of accessibility and inclusiveness downtown has to be a collaborative effort between a lot of owners to start solving it. A good example of that was Jeremy Charles, when he opened Raymond's, because he's a pretty conscious individual, he wanted to make Raymond's accessible. But there was no way in all the geometric studies, all the plans, whatever, for that to happen within the territory of his property. A few years down the road, the Alt Hotel comes in, and for me, at that particular moment, that's when Alt and Jeremy Charles, meaning it's, it's, the connections are made by the city officials. It's pr the proactive of the city that does this, not Jeremy or the owners of Alt. But they put the demands on Alt to position their elevator in a way that it is used by Raymond's as well as the Alt Hotel. And, all of a, and, and, and actually Raymond's invests money in the elevator and actually they have a, a budget that they can do other things with for their project because somebody paid some of their elevator. This is just opening the door to the idea that you can solve problems but you've got to go beyond your territory to solve them. Away we go. This continues the conversation about embracing fog, wind, and rain in St. John's, embracing our dramatic uh, environment and climate. And uh, it's, it's important to, to realize that what, what we're trying to propose is that we're able to go out in the community, outside, in our city, use our city that way, more than just what some people call two or three days during the summer. What I'm trying to say is that the city should be investing in small projects that go in these parks that allow this place to be interesting to visit on all those other parts of the year where you can go outside, it might be drizzling, but if you were protected, if you had a little radiant heat, if you knew that little zone had Wi-Fi, so on and so forth, I've said this already, that it makes it viable to do so. Like it becomes, in your pattern language, in your patterning of your life using the city, you would know to go to this exterior living room. And we need a bunch of them.
architects can be accused of being a bit uh, mouthy, uh, a bit opinionated, and I have been constantly talking about this business of a platform escalator, and I just, I just brought that up and I imagined it in my mind and whatever. I decided this year I better look into this. <laughs> so, and, and that's why it's good that you, when you're doing, because a lot of our work is collaborative, it's good to have you know, an engineer type, although I do believe myself partially an engineer because that's what architecture is all about, but you know, someone that kind of sets me straight, we'll say. But I did, I decided to look in Google for, oh, there must be some company making platform escalators. Well, there isn't. <laughs> They don't exist. What's interesting is Japan is actually trying to develop one, and it's primarily in, in uh, uh, response to the wheelchair. But I'm talking about a platform escalator that's in response to a parent with a stroller. And of course, then it would obviously be okay for a wheelchair. All I think that means is, like everything that we do as human beings, it's just an opportunity for something that to, of that type to be designed and manufactured. And we should have three of them in the city of St. John's. But there are plenty of examples of medieval villages that are built on the sides of little mountains and they inserted an elevator. And the elevator was an exterior elevator. So it dealt with being sort of outside. It dealt with moving people from one elevation to another. We should have three more of those strategically placed so that our city becomes more walkable. Done. show and the uh, it's not an accessible space so they began talking to us about the possibility of doing something there and uh, but you haven't been able to go in there have you no I haven't been able to go in there at all not accessible um, and from that day you guys went to go check it out it looked like the outside might be possible but we don't know what the inside could hold so yeah uh, uh, so yeah, I haven't been in there yet. It's, uh, it wasn't the most popular company uh, spots. Uh, they go on uh, every week, so it would be uh, it would be a real pleasure for me to be able to actually go into Trapper Town. It's a real 
it would be a real pleasure to go to Trapezon because it's the most popular comedy spot uh, in the city. So being able to make them more accessible, not only for me, but for people who want to go out and see a comedy show, uh, I think making Trapezon accessible would be a uh, pretty cool thing to do. I think Trapezon is very important for Trapezon to be uh, accessible because it's such an art spot for comedy and a lot of make it accessible, make it open for that many more people. <laughs> Yeah, and that's how, um, I guess, we got working together in the first place, was uh, you started the Accessible NL group after the uh, CBC interview where, you know, uh, Ryan Cook followed you around on George Street here to see what is actually accessible on George Street, and there's not much. <laughs> right? no. It's really, overall, at least, it's the only spot that's really, uh, you know, comfortable for for people to get in and out if they're using assistive devices and also have washer facilities available on site as well. So Yeah, O'Reilly is definitely the only accessible place. But uh, I think you learn something cool and why it's accessible. Um, and the owners actually wasn't really thinking about making it accessible. But uh, when they took over, uh, a mutual friend of mine, um, Suggestion to make the bathroom accessible because they got one downstairs and they got the bathroom upstairs and the one downstairs obviously is not gonna not gonna work but the one upstairs is accessible so I've already found that out uh, not too long ago so it's really important to um, when people are running a business or uh, taking over a new spot. It's really important, if you can, to make it accessible and think about how we can be accessible to allow more people uh, to come visit your space. Well, you're talking about like just being, the, you know, when those decisions are being made, that it's a priority. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah it should definitely be a priority and not an afterthought, because yeah. so when it's an afterthought, it's so often that it is this. Accessibility is so often an afterthought that when you do think about it, then depending on the spot, it might actually not be possible to make it accessible. Whereas if from the beginning you built it ground up with accessibility in mind, then you don't run into that problem later on down the road. Well, we approached Grant uh, to come look at this spot at Trevor John's. Hey, just walk, go by and take a look at it and see um, what he saw. And then we had this discussion. Yeah, there's uh, there's some really amazing examples in town of total accessible or inclusion, and they happen to be Walmart and Starbucks, <laughs> uh, which is kind of funny. But um, that's because they... Well, both of them are American companies, but they also create this seamless way of entering their buildings. You don't even know that you are on a ramp and you already started the ramp, kind of like back at when you parked your car. It's much more difficult to rework the geometry of uh, the fabric of downtown St. John's, and most people will throw their hands up and, and kind of protect themselves, whereby they say, well, I can't do anything with my, my property. I can't do anything with my property. But one thing that we started realizing is that if a group of people, a group, group of owners could get together and start looking at the total movement of uh, the person in a wheelchair or, because I always emphasize, you know, my age bracket, we don't get around that well. So the idea that the walkability of the terrain is a little bit better than what we normally deal with is an absolute must for the majority of the population, not just that we're supposed to provide for the, for the wheelchair. So when Ke Kelly and I met here, the first go-round, we came back, and we were just walking up and down the street, 
just realize that the elevation that we're standing at right here, which has this giant staircase, which is kind of peculiar in itself, but this giant staircase, is actually almost level with the decks that are in front of three establishments, right? There's three bars here. Yeah. Of all three bars. So if I started a flat sidewalk from this point, from this elevation, and just shot it over to those establishments, I would already be accessible automatically. I'm not even, I'm not even going up. Mm. I'm just staying flat. Mm -hmm. So you, you begin to see the need to really study the whole street elevation-wise. Uh, and we joke around, but the idea that Georgetown, George Street would be reworked for loads of reasons, <laughs> uh, would be a plus for the city. You know, it, it, it's like an interesting little place, but it hasn't had uh, a comprehensive look at in a while. Well, comprehensive is, I mean, this is it. If we tried to put a ramp on Trapper John's, probably doesn't work within the yeah. footprint of that, exactly. of that building and where you can do that. But if you look at a larger scale and comprehensive to me is the same thing as holistic, you know, Agreed. not just looking at one issue, either looking at a multitude of issues and concerns and, you know, just how you approach a design, you know, process anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it, and it doesn't leave it just to the the owner, one owner at a time dealing yeah. with the problem. And, and, you know, what ends up happening is these ugly will say ramps getting put in because they don't have any other choice. Another example of this, because this is sort of the end of our little uh, walk, is that, and this is just a point of view that, I'm, and I'm not trying to come down on money being spent or decisions being made by city officials or whatever, but there was a tremendous amount of money and it's still happening. It's just being finished off, which is called the I think Dave Lane called it the big dig. And uh, that happened in Boston. It was a big, major big dig. But we had our little dig of Water Street. And the funny part about the material that, the primary material that's used to rework Water Street and all of its sidewalks is concrete. And what a lot of people don't realize is that concrete is liquid first. So there was a possibility of that liquid to go up and down, up and down, all along solving all the accessible problems <laughs> along its journey. And it actually would fold itself over to the street and it would go down and drain all the water. And, and then maybe the curb cuts aren't there because they're like medieval and they, they don't have a curb cut, right? And, and there's some... We solve so many problems, we finally have money for lighting and, and you know, and, and on and on. Now, I know that's after the fact, but in reality, the accessibility issue and the inclusion issue was on the, the city's plate when they were designing that because I remember going to the meetings. It just wasn't a proactive statement that was an absolute that had to be solved from the top the city officials point of view. Well, there's just no time dedicated to it. Exactly. Like, this is always what it is. But loads of studies. <laughs> yeah, studies. But then, you know, the time to really consider da data, yeah. right? And really look at it. So we don't take time to do things. We rush through. And we, and we don't, uh, what's weird about St. John's, it's been going on, it still goes on. They hire off the island. Mm. Oh, really? I know for a fact that there is an oh. amazing group of people here who are professionals as well as experts who obviously know what's going on in St. John's and that's not who we hire. They don't hire a collaborative group that represents that. They go to, know, they go to uh, Halifax and hire an engineering firm that just because they have a track record of doing buses. I, 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 I don't get this at all. So. That needs to change, and, and maybe by these little videos we're doing that. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. oh Save the world. Oh, save the world. No, we're not saving <laughs> the world. <laughs> we're making a statement. Yeah, yeah. That's all we can do. Yeah, no, it is all we can do, make yeah. a statement. And, um, you know, we, we look at all of our projects that way as an opportunity to make a statement. And from the smallest ramp project to, you know, the biggest development, 
Yeah. There's always an opportunity to make a statement. Yeah. And uh, so it would be great to have the chance to work on something like George Street. That would be really cool. I'd love to do that. These kinds of things have to come forward because they're too, they're couched too much with my, my, what's called the minority. And, and in reality, it's not a minority. No, it it's, isn't. It's a majority of people that need their environment to be more accessible. Yeah, it's the majority. It's got nothing to do with, with uh, people such as Josh with this perfect machine he's got. I'd like to have one. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the fact that we can solve problems like that. You know, that's where we are with technology. Mm -hmm. We're not, we're not uh, uh, you know, 30 years ago. So. No, there's a lot of things that are possible now yeah. because of technology. And, uh, you know, think of accessibility as being just around the built environment because, you know, I, that's what I'm into and I talk about that a lot. But there's other, other issues of accessibility around uh, communications and technology is really easy to solve. <laughs> really easy when looked at in this comprehensive yeah. way, like you're talking about. And everything really is going towards seamless. You know, the fact that you can go to a foreign country and be speaking your language and it gets translated right away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that that's crazy. It's okay. amazing. But that's a reality. Yeah. And so you you could be sitting at a. We used to do it by sign language when we visited Europe. Because we didn't know their language, but we had and we had a lot of fun. And the drunker you got, the more sign language worked. <laughs> so there's something about that. But the fact of the matter is that you can just put a computer in, in play, and it's doing all this for you.